Ten, War and Warriors. War and Warriors is a discourse that deals with the subject of war. We live at a time when war is universally considered a bad thing, but this is not how it was seen in the past. War used to be seen in a very romantic light, as a place of adventure, heroism and greatness. It is only after World War I that war started to be truly denigrated. Before that, in the 19th century, it was subject for debate. The modern progress was supposed to lead to utopia, which would bring an end to wars, so peace on earth was a goal. But the old romanticization of war was also still around. Let's see Zarathustra's take on it. By our best enemies we do not want to be spared, nor by those either whom we love from the very heart. So let me tell you the truth. My brethren in war, I love you from the very heart. I am and was ever your counterpart, and I am also your best enemy. So let me tell you the truth. I know the hatred and envy of your hearts. Ye are not great enough not to know of hatred and envy. Then be great enough not to be ashamed of them. And if ye cannot be saints of knowledge, then I pray you be at least its warriors. They are the companions and forerunners of such saintship. The belief in utopia is often accompanied by the belief that human nature is good, and humans would live in peace and harmony if we solve the issues that set them apart. Zarathustra disagrees. He sees hatred and envy as part of human nature. Thus, he tells us not to be ashamed of them, but to turn them in a positive direction. That direction is war, but he is talking specifically about the battle of ideas, meant to lead to greater knowledge. So he is talking about a more peaceful kind of conflict. Then again, a battle of ideas can often turn violent, and Zarathustra doesn't seem to make a distinction between spiritual and physical conflict. All war is good, as long as it revolves around the pursuit of knowledge. Because of that, he sees his enemies, as well as his allies, as all belonging to the same brethren. If we want to grow and achieve greater knowledge, we need good enemies to challenge us. Therefore, he encourages us to fight with all our might, and present great challenges to each other. I see many soldiers. Could I but see many warriors? Uniform, one calleth what they wear. May it not be uniform, what they therewith hide. Ye shall be those whose eyes ever seek for an enemy, for your enemy. And with some of you there is hatred at first sight. Your enemy shall ye seek, your war shall ye wage. And for the sake of your thoughts, and if your thoughts succumb, your uprightness shall still shout triumph thereby. Once again, he emphasizes the diversity of humans. He already told us that everyone has their own ideal, their own virtue. Therefore, everyone should also seek their own enemies, those who will challenge their individual ideas. And if you lose the battle and your idea proves to be false, you will still gain something by it, as it will correct your path. Ye shall love peace as a means to new wars, and the short peace more than the long. You I advise not to work, but to fight. You I advise not to peace, but to victory. Let your work be a fight, let your peace be a victory. One can only be silent and sit peacefully when one hath arrow and bow, otherwise one prateth and quarreleth. Let your peace be a victory. Peace, says Zarathustra, is not such a great thing. Since human nature seeks conflict, you will spend your peace time bickering about trivial stuff. It would be better to seek true causes to fight about. You should not accept peace until full victory is achieved, and then you should seek the next worthy cause to fight about. Ye say it is the good cause which halloweth even war. I say unto you, it is the good war which halloweth every cause. War and courage have done more great things than charity. Not your sympathy, but your bravery have hitherto saved the victims. What is good, ye ask? To be brave is good. Let the little girls say, to be good is what is pretty, and at the same time touching. They call you heartless, but your heart is true, and I love the bashfulness of your goodwill. 
Ye are ashamed of your flow, and others are ashamed of their ebb. Ye are ugly. Well then, my brethren, take the sublime about you, the mantle of the ugly. Until now, he spoke of war being a good thing because it helps us refine our ideas. Now he adds that war is also good for our character. It develops courage, and courageous people are virtuous people. Thus, humanity becomes better. The idea that charity is the thing that should drive us is a folly. In the long run, charity leads to the degradation of humanity into a pitiful state, and then it becomes wicked. War, on the other hand, creates greater and better humans. And when your soul becometh great, then doth it become haughty, and in your sublimity there is wickedness. I know you. In wickedness the haughty man and the weakling meet, but they misunderstand one another. I know you. So Arthusa told us that war makes us better people, but he warns us not to fall into the trap of believing that in that which transcends our human nature. Hate and envy, he said in the beginning, are part of us, and it remains part of us even when we become great. We should remember that. Ye shall only have enemies to be hated, but not enemies to be despised. Ye must be proud of your enemies. Then the success of your enemies are also your successes. Previously he told us that we should choose our enemies wisely. Here he adds that they should not be people that we despise. Your enemies are your partners in your struggle to grow. The worthier they are, the more they challenge and strengthen you. Resistance. That is the distinction of the slave. Let your distinction be obedience. Let your commanding itself be obeying. To the good warrior soundeth thou shalt pleasanter than I will, and all that is dear unto you ye shall first have it commanded unto you. This is an early appearance of Nietzsche's rejection of what he later termed slave morality. And it seems curious at first. His philosophy is a philosophy of individual freedom, and yet here he tells us that it is noble to obey, while resistance is the mark of the slave. How does obedience figure into his philosophy of freedom? What Zarathustra means is this. If you follow your own will, you are expressing what you are. What you are is a man, but our goal, remember, is to surpass man and become superman. For that, you must break what you are now. And this cannot be done by just satisfying your desires. You should therefore impose an external code on yourself and obey it. This seems to contradict his stance that one should not obey an external moral code. But the solution to it is simple. What Zarathustra objects to is a universal moral code. Those should be rejected. But a personal moral code is necessary to achieve self-surpassing. Let your love to life be love to your highest hope and let your highest hope be the highest thought of life. Your highest thought, however, ye shall have it commanded unto you by me, and it is this, man is something that is to be surpassed. Again, everyone should wage their own war, following their own ideal. But there is also one universal principle that should guide them all, the idea of self-surpassing. So live your life of obedience and of war. What matter about long life? What warrior wisheth to be spared? I spare you not. I love you from my very heart, my brethren in war. Thus spake Zarathustra. On we go then, into the next battle.